Uh, I'm most grateful to uh, Charlene and to Scottish Autism for the opportunity to share some ideas on coping and how the ancient and modern world coincide in ways that can help us. So what do we mean by coping? National surveys across the world suggest that significant numbers of people of all ages do not feel that they have the adequate coping strategies to deal with day-to-day -day life challenges. They report that the feeling that stress is affecting their health, both physically and emotionally. Survey results tend to fluctuate each year, but the findings generally show the same pattern, that people need to find effective ways to relieve stress in their lives, and they face a variety of stresses. We have seen the emergence of a range of strategies related to what has been called positive or popular psychology, and which involve self-improvement and something called resilience. But are these changes and these challenges and the approaches used really that new? And what do we owe and what do we learn from those who have gone before us, the ancients? This talk will be a short account of my personal journey to provide a context for my argument and some points that I hope will be as helpful to you as they have been to me. And finally, I recommend some helpful texts. This will not be a lecture on Greek or Roman classics, as this is beyond my brief and certainly my level of knowledge and capability. The talk is also within the context of autism, but is not a talk on autism. I suppose, like many people, my real interest in philosophy began when I was in my 20s. I'd read classics at school, but apart from the odd sound bite, these had not really resonated with me. I were not that well taught, or maybe I was just an unreceptive or unrewarding student. As the Stoic philosopher Epictetus, or Epictetus said, almost 2000 years ago now, there was no fertile ground or practical reason for the ideas to take root, and that learning philosophy from books without context was a waste of time. And I, would certain, and I would tend to agree with that. In the 1970s, I was working in a traditional hospital-based mental health service when a close school friend of mine, also called Richard, uh, was diagnosed with schizophrenia. His family was no fan of traditional psychiatry or the hospital where I was based and did their best to keep him out of our clutches. Richard was referred to an alternative source of treatment in London in the form of Dr. Leon Redler, who was an American psychiatrist working with the Philadelphia Association and was a close colleague of the renowned and at the time controversial Scottish psychiatrist, Dr. R.D. Ronnie Lang. The approach was to provide psychotherapy rather than drugs or ECT, which was the traditional approach at the time, as part of a holistic approach known as existential psychiatry in a therapeutic community. I kept in touch with Richard and it was obvious that he was doing rather well. He weathered the storm of his breakdown much better than most of the patients I'd worked with and remained psychologically intact with none of the deterioration or emotional blunting that was commonly found in people with a diagnosis of schizophrenia. So when, through our continued contact, an opportunity arose for me to uh, work and reside at the uh, Archway community in London, I took it. By then, three books had made a particular impression on me. The Doctor and the Soul by Viktor Frankl, the survivor of Auschwitz, and the originator of Logotherapy, and The Politics of Experience and the Bird of Paradise, and The Divided Self by Ronnie Lang. Both Frankel and Lang emphasized the, the subjective nature of existence or experiencing and the relevance of man's search for meaning. Lang saw psychosis as a journey of normal adjustment to being psychologically overwhelmed. The established view of, the, of schizophrenia at the time as purely a biological phenomenon 
was rejected by Lang. Residency at Archway, or more particularly the influence of Leon and an American psychiatrist from Boston, Will Saunders, exposed me to various practical expressions of philosophy, notably existentialism and Buddhism, and the value of calm reflection. Both of these men were among the calmest people I've ever met, role models in keeping your head and in always having a plan invaluable attributes in a place which despite being in the main a place of calm and tranquility could also be chaotic and somewhat unpredictable we were living among people with acute psychotic problems where visits from the police or the authorities were not unknown therefore reflection self-awareness the importance of having a plan for when things didn't work out and a plan b uh, with practice became second nature. Will was also very well read and introduced me to the practical philosophies of Epictetus and Seneca. Taught me the power of how as human beings we tend to frame things based on our biases and our emotions and how this could build barriers, drive further emotions which further influence our attitudes and beliefs, which in turn determine our responses and our behaviour. The people I lived with were not patients or schizophrenics anymore, but my friends and my acquaintances. Their symptoms were valid expressions of how they were experiencing their world. I was there to be with them, to listen to them and to guide them, not to control them. I tried hard to stop making judgments based on medical labels or collections of symptoms as I'd been trained, or assess how well people were doing on whether or not they were taking their medication and complying with treatment plans. This helped me to stop seeing people as the other, with me as a neutral bystander, and I began to see people in ways that my traditional training had obscured. It taught me that having a plan for what might happen and rehearsing that plan reduced stress for everybody. I had needed to be retrained, or rather detrained. I also learned important lessons about what was and what was not within my control. The stoic principles of logic, the truth, ethics, that is aiming to do the right thing, and virtue and physics with nature became important. Implications for life and practice in the form of knowing what is and what is not within our control examining our impressions, as Epictetus uh, remarked, and premeditating things, or, or premeditating adversity coolly, the Seneca um, advice. They were all important lessons that have stayed with me. These were central to think to our thinking when around 10 years ago, we were devising our program for working with people who were working with children with challenging behavior called Synergy, the Atom Autism Program Synergy, developed with our late colleague, Micah McCready and our friends in Athens. I returned to my role in the NHS after Archway much changed as a person and as a practitioner, and I think better for it, but I was no longer as confident as previously, and I had learned to admit when I didn't have an answer which was quite difficult at the time within the NHS, which whilst reducing my stress at one level, increased inner conflict as I was often in doubt. On reflection, I was probably painfully ponderous, weighing up on the pros and cons of emotions and actions. I suspect this was a source of some irritation to my managers and my colleagues, but I had seen the benefit of the approach and was not about to give it up. As Epictetus advocated, I had learned how to consider what was within my control and focus on that. To do my best to make the right choices, to be virtuous, to do the right thing and ethical, to examine my impressions and to premeditate
premeditate adversity coolly, to have a plan for when things go wrong and to rehearse that plan. Richard, Leon and Will had been good teachers and good role models. Reflecting on those times, these principles have continued to influence me and to resonate in my subsequent work in mental health, intellectual disabilities and in autism. Following discussion with Charlene and thinking about the topic of coping and the ancient world for this talk, I've tried to boil these down into three interlinked take home points. The first is to know what is within our control and what is not. And if we think of them as parcels, um, each containing a number of ingredients, it's, it, this might be helpful. The second to examine our, our impressions. And the third is to premeditate adversity coolly. And I will deal with these in turn. Parcel one, knowing what is and what is not within our control. We often spend a great deal of time worrying about things which we are unable to do much about. The Greeks call this agonia or anxiety. This might include the weather, what people might think of us, our reputation, the virus, whether we get sick or die, how other people behave, politics, how the country is run, in short, those things. This can be damaging in that it takes time away from focusing on the things that we can change or we can learn to change, namely ourselves. In the Socratic tradition, we are all capable of change if we are aware of the need to change and appreciate that much of what we can do is up to us. We can change our own actions, our thoughts, beliefs, and our character. We can choose to be virtuous and to do the right thing. It is up to us. Proeresis is the Greek word, the fundamental concept of the Stoic philosophy of Epictetus. It represents the choices that we can make, the choices involved in giving or withholding assent to our impressions. It's how we learn self-control. This particularly relates to control of anxiety or of anger knowing what is within our control and what is not, getting control over emotions is the first step. Doing the right thing comes close behind. Chrysippus urges us to work hard to learn to control our temper and to avoid anger or confrontation. We can practice this by learning to respond to insults with humor. We can learn to be modest and humble. We can be generous. We can listen carefully to other people. We can speak well of others. We can choose who we take as our friends. We can choose our words carefully. We can learn to be self-aware. We can choose who influences us. We can help people who need our help, not to change them or for a reward or outcome, but because we can do it, we can be kind. There is much we can do. The Stoics taught us that we are more likely to live the good life if we pay attention to our character in everything we do. We try to be virtuous regardless of the outcome. Socrates gave up his life rather than to sacrifice his principles to virtue. This leads on to the second take home point, parcel two. Despite our best intentions, if we get things, we, we often get things wrong. We make our judgments based on our emotional responses, the narrative influences or the stories that we're told, or our mindset or our biases. We tend to see things in black or white terms, calling them good or bad. But what is good or bad depends on the context. It depends on where we are coming from. For example, creme brulee for dessert may, may sound good unless you're a diabetic. Losing a toe sounds bad unless the alternative is losing your foot or your whole leg or even your life. The pandemic sounds bad. It can be an opportunity, it has been an opportunity 
to reflect how full and wonderful life was before, and if we survive, will be again. How it has freed up time and space for us to do other things, to develop a sense of community, to be good and kind with other people. So the descriptions good or bad are therefore misleading and meaningless and in stoic terms should be replaced by words that more accurately describe the circumstances. In the case of autism, the familiar behaviours often seen in autism were for so long defined as problems or bad, dismissed or warranting treatment rather than being accepted for what they are, a part of who the person is. Although some elements of this story remain, it is changing. I recently saw a TV programme featuring Richard and his autistic son Jacko and how Richard had come to see Jacko's stimming behaviour not as bad, requiring treatment, but as something that, in Richard's word, words fill my heart with joy, rather than seeing and describing stimming as good or bad, Richard explained why for Jacko stimming was part of who he was and that his father witnessing it made him very happy as he knew that Jacko was in a good place and was happy and relaxed. The sociologist Max Weber spoke of the concept of Verstehen or deep understanding or to understand things deeply to avoid superficial or false impressions, reflecting on lived experience and culture. It is not known if Weber studied the Stoics, but much of what he taught us can be traced back to those times. When the psychologist Albert Ellis, one of the founders of CBT, is quoted as saying, people are not disturbed by things, but rather their view of things, he is acknowledging Epictetus, Men are disturbed not by things, but by their opinions about them, emphasizing the importance of accurate and calm self-reflection and objective analysis, or examining our impressions. This is expanded by the psychologist Daniel Kahneman when thinking about how human beings behave differently under different conditions and how they respond to risk that the brain is wired to think, in, 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 think fast at times of crisis and slow and more reflective when one has time to do this. How we must be trained to think calmly and to avoid errors of judgment related to stress or biases. If not, panic can ensue or our biases go unchallenged. Our anxieties continue to grow. Kahneman provides a helpful illustration of this in the way that he describes the emotional brain, which he calls system one, the fight or flight mode of the brain, versus the rational brain, system two. The importance of knowing the difference and of being self-aware, knowing whether one is in emotional mode or in rational mode, thinking fast or thinking slow. In short, better and more rational decisions are made based on the judgments that we make when we are reflective or in system two. And the act of switching from system one to system two is covered in my third point. More recently, positive psychology has become popular and with it, the quest for happiness. Aristotle agreed that happiness was a reasonable goal for life, but agreeing what happiness is was complicated. In other words, there could be no template for happiness, but that people could not be happy without virtue. Some modern examples of positive psychology emphasizing flourishing and fulfillment, such as those provided by Martin Seligman, have even found favor at government level in the UK and the USA. But these are criticized as in conflict with Stoic philosophy in that they may be more designed to feed the ego than to challenge it, providing a template on how to be happy rather than virtuous. The philosopher Jules Evans comments that Osama bin Laden would probably have scored highly on Seligman's PERMA model 
for living a good life or a fulfilled life. Psychological approaches with a more spiritual dimension have also grown in popularity with the Buddhist influenced mindfulness developed by Kabat-Zinn, emphasizing the importance of being present and self-aware. But valuable as, as these observations are, and many are valuable, the Stoics got there first, in particular Epictetus, some 2000 years ago. The third and final parcel involves drawing on previous points to remain in control of oneself with as little, with, sorry, with as full as understanding of the situation as possible to formulate and rehearse a plan for dealing with it. Seneca emphasized that the purpose of this was not to ruminate or to worry, but to think through each aspect calmly and rationally in advance to have a plan for how you're going to respond. For example, if we're going to be faced by a difficult meeting or an interview, anticipate the questions and how to respond and rehearse each one. In life, we may experience episodes where we anticipate feeling irritation or annoyance, or we are in danger. We can practice dealing with them in our mind in advance and envisage our calm response. We can reflect each morning on what we did the previous day and learn from that. We can even formalize, form, formalize these ideas in a written form. Similarly, if we're in a situation where we are meeting people who may have been stigmatized or marginalized for whatever reason, we can examine our biases and our prejudices and think carefully about our impressions before we meet them. We can think about how they might be experiencing their experience, including their experience of us. We can formulate a plan for how we will be, how we will be when we're with them. We can switch from system one, as Kahneman said, the emotional brain, to system two, the rational or the thinking brain. And we can continue to examine our impressions. The same principles can be extended to situations of potential confrontation or violence. The important thing is that we have a plan on how we behave, what we need to do to prepare, how we can organize for what we can do. And this is the basis of the Synergy program. We can set ourselves the goals of remaining calm and in control and knowing how uh, in control of ourselves and knowing how we will respond to any situation, how we can be kind, rational, under any circumstances. And with practice, like driving a car, this becomes second nature. The England cricket captain, Graham Gooch, is said to have had a version of the Benjamin Franklin quotation inscribed on his bat. By failing to prepare, we prepare to fail. And this is a very useful maxim. Finally, to conclude, some recommended light reading for you. Um, the Epictetus uh, book, Discourses, Fragments and the Handbook. The Enchiridion, Epictetus and Seneca's very short book on the shortness of life. Well, I hope this has been helpful. Um, there will be, uh, I will pre present these notes um, in, in a paper to Scottish Autism. And um, if, you, if you'd like to have it, um, then I'm sure that they will provide, or you could send uh, me an email and I'll be very happy to let you have them. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for listening.